Hi, and welcome to another edition of Danny Brown Talks Phoenix. As always, I am your host, Danny Brown, and joined with me is Garrett Sergvenik. Welcome to the show, Garrett. Thank you. Thanks for having me, as yeah, always. Absolutely. And this is our market update um, covering Des- November's numbers. November, yes. Yeah. So it's our November market update, but this is December. Yep. So some of the, da- the data that we're going to go over today might be outdated by the time people listen to it. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the stuff we're going to talk about for the month of November, uh, it was a crazy month. Lots of stuff has taken place since the last time you and I met. Um, right now on the MLS for Phoenix, we've got just under 14,000 properties listed for sale. So that's so, pretty level. Yeah, I mean, I think it was the same last time. Well, it's actually about 5% lower than, Ooh, than last month. Yeah, so last month we were over 14,000. So we had 14,500. This month we have 13,800. Wow. So it's going down, which is pretty normal for the month of December. Uh, November headed into December. Not a lot of people are listing during the holidays. Okay. Um, we're even seeing it in our own business. This is the first time I can ever remember where we literally have zero active listings on the market. Hmm. They all went under contract, and we are kind of sandbagging the first of the beginning of the year. We've got a ton in the pipeline, but everybody wants to wait until after the holidays, which is relatively normal. Yeah. Do you think people are also maybe settling a little bit and buying up some of that? I mean, you know, I, I feel like for the people that are out there actively shopping, you know, they may be getting, you know, have been doing so for the last few months. At least yes. some of my buyers have been doing that. And some so of them the buying, seem like they're just kind of, okay, I'm going to take this because mm-hmm. there's nothing else on the market. Correct. So the buying season has definitely been extended much longer than it normally is. We are having our best fourth quarter that we've ever had. Hmm. And that's really, I think it's due to a combination of things, but one of the things that we're seeing in the marketplace is there's a lot of buyers that weren't able to find homes in that later uh, summer, early fall season where we sometimes see, you know, we've talked about this in previous podcasts where we see an uptick in market activity during those months, Mm -hmm. and then we see a steep drop off during the holidays. holidays, So, you know, buyers right now are not able to find homes as quickly because there's not many choices for them. Um, So we're, you know, severe lack of inventory right now, just to give people context. And again, we've talked about this in previous podcasts. For us to be in a balanced market, we should be closer to 40,000 active listings on the market. So we are, there's just a severe lack of inventory. And this is a problem nationwide, not just a Phoenix issue. Hmm. So markets across the country are facing facing this. Um, So last month, uh, monthly sales, there was just over 7,000 sales uh, versus 6,600 this time last year. But we're down 11.5% from last month. Wow. So the total number of sales has definitely gone down. Again, I think that has a lot to do with the holiday season. But if you compare this year to last year, we're up over 7%. And I think that that is directly due to buyers extending that kind of buying Got fall it. buying season that we just touched on. The average sales price, though, fortunately for buyers, actually went down month over month. Again, that's pretty typical. Um, so that dropped down to 281000 from 285000 uh, last month. And this time last year, uh, <laughs> prices were at 260500 as the average. Got so $20,000 higher that's from a year ago. Is that yeah. 8%, 7%? Yeah, 8%. Like yeah, up almost 8% wow. from this time last year. You know, in a normal balanced market, home values typically increase with inflation, right? Somewhere Correct. in the 2 to 4% range. So yes. seeing an 8% year-over-year growth is, is massive. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think uh, we'll touch on this. We're going to do a... Uh, bold predictions and kind Mm -hmm. of review what our predictions were for uh, 2019. And I had predicted that home prices were going to go up over 4%. um, And it's up 8%. Eight percent. Look at you, just doubling <laughs> things up. Great. No, I mean, so uh, like they went up, yes, absolutely. But I was wrong. They went up a lot. Yeah, year over year. And because we, I mean, we thought you know at the beginning or the end of twenty eighteen, as the market started to shift, rates started to climb a little bit, that you know that home values were going to level off, you know, because you know they'd been on such this this crazy incline for the yeah. last few years. You know that uh, we thought that was going to come off, it. but you you predicted right that it was going to continue to increase, and um, I you know would hope that it's going to continue doing that through 2020. I think so. So what I'm predicting into 2020 is that we're already seeing upward 
push on pricing. So mm -hmm. we're seeing list prices are higher than mm -hmm. what they've traditionally been. been. Um, and this is, this is simply just, I'm not an economist, you're not an economist, but we know supply and demand. So when supply is low and demand is high, what's naturally gonna happen? Yeah, prices prices are, are gonna get pushed up. Uh, I read a statistic put out by Redfin, now this is nationally, that uh, one out of every four homes in 2020 will have multiple offers on it. Wow. I think Phoenix is gonna be drastically higher than that hmm. because we are one of the markets that have the fewest inventory for, for a city our size. So mm -hmm. I think that we're gonna have many more um, bidding wars, many more multiple offers into 2020 um, if everything holds constant. Got it. Um, so what does that mean to buyers? Well, that means that you need to do things to differentiate yourself. Um, removing some of the contingencies that you might normally have in place can set you apart from other buyers. Maybe maybe shortening the inspection period. 10 days is a long time. Hmm. You know, you can get a lot done in five. You know, back when I was doing bank owned properties, the standard inspection period for a bank owned home was five days. Hmm. And so you can get a lot of inspections and a lot of stuff done in five days. So maybe yeah. shortening that inspection period could differentiate you from other buyers. Working with a lender that can actually close you very, very quickly. Yes. You know, I mean, you know, typical close of escrow is 30 days, but, you know, there, you know, on my end, there tends to be this big lull in the middle. You know, it's I, a hurry up and wait process. Exactly. Like, oh, I need all this stuff like right away, yep. and then the buyers are just sitting there, their agents just sitting there twiddling their thumbs yep. for a couple of weeks, and then it's like, oh my gosh, I need all this stuff. Yeah. You know, it's a very, very much a hurry up and wait process. Yep. Where with you guys, it's it's not that way. You guys are so on top of it, and you guys can close things as quickly sometimes as like twenty, right? Uh, we could, we could, if if we wanted to, if if you were willing to order an appraisal right up front, so eliminate you know that waiting period. That's the biggest waiting period. Sure. But if we got an appraisal ordered, you know, let's say after a five day inspection, ordered it on a rush, we could probably have a loan closed in two weeks. So I mean, to do you know, especially you know, I mean, buyers. They, you know, there, there's, there's stuff that they're, they're moving towards, you know, maybe they've already found another house, you know, or they, you know, they, they want to get out of whatever they're in quickly. I mean, the whole selling a home process is terrible, right? You got to yeah, keep Well, it clean, being you know. a seller, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, if you could say, tell somebody that they could do a 15 day close of escrow instead of a 30, that's a huge selling point. Yeah. You know, that's 15 days less of interest that they have to pay, you know, and stuff like that. So, so some other things that we're telling our buyers to do dif to differentiate themselves is the real estate transaction because of technology has gotten very cold. So typically when you're writing an offer, it's all done online. You know, we send it to our buyers using an e-sign software. They click through their email and they sign it. And then you email it over to the listing agent who then prevent, presents it to the seller. And it's just a name and a purchase price and like the details of the offer. Mm -hmm. So there's no, you know, humanization to the transaction, if that's the right, you know, wordage, but it yeah. works. Um, so if you can sometimes, if you can some way add you know, some personality to your offer to humanize the transaction, I think that that really helps differentiate you from other buyers. Mm -hmm. And you can do that in a number of ways. One of the things that we like to do is have you write a personal letter to the seller on why you like their home. Uh, touch on things that really resonate with you in the house, mm -hmm. such as the updates that it has. And embellish, even if it's not necessarily true, yeah. you want to try and tug at the heartstrings of that seller because for most sellers, selling a home is an emotional process. Yeah. A house is just not a thing. You've celebrated holidays there. You've raised kids there. You've done all these different things. And that means a lot to people. And they want to sell their home to uh, somebody who's going to love and cherish their their home like they did. Yeah. And so if you can touch on those things, oftentimes you can get your offer accepted over somebody else, even if you're not the highest offer mm -hmm. or have the best terms because they like you. Yeah. Uh, I think including a family photo, including kids, if you don't have kids, include your pets. Make so, up some kids. Just throw them in there, do a little Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Toss them in there. So. Yeah, right? Um, and, and something that uh, some buyers that I've seen do uh, started doing are doing personal videos instead mm -hmm. and so it doesn't have to be high production you can get with your buyer's agent and they can film it on their phone and you just tell you know introduce yourself to those sellers and tell them why you love their home and why you're making an offer on it mm -hmm. if you're fortunate enough when you're out showing homes and we often tell our sellers to not be present when the buyer's walking through the house because it's awkward but if you are a buyer and you're in a home and the seller you happen to see the sellers 
talk to them. You know, make them get to know you and like you if you're going to be submitting that offer mm. because all of those things can really mean the difference between you getting the home and not getting the home as well as potentially saving, you know, five, ten thousand dollars on on the purchase price. So those are just a few things in a hot market in a seller's market that buyers can do to help get their offer accepted. And then perseverance, you know, don't get married to an individual property and don't get disappointed if you get beat out on it. Yeah. There's always going to be another home and it just takes perseverance. Yeah. Keep trying, keep trying, keep trying because eventually it's going to stick. So try not to get too discouraged in these hot markets um, like the one that we're facing and just continue to try because it will eventually happen for you. Mm -hmm. You just have to keep at it. Yeah, and ebb and flow because, I mean, you know, there are people that have deadlines. You know, I've got a lease coming up and I need to be out of my apartment by this date. But make a backup plan, you know, have something to do in between so you're not settling on a property that you wouldn't normally buy just to buy something because if you don't like it and you have to sell it again, you're going to pay a real estate commission on that. And, yeah. you know, and, and so it's, it's, you're going to waste money by doing that. You're going to, you're going to spend less money doing something in the, in the interim, you know, than you will by getting into a property you don't love. Yeah. So. And, uh, you know, one of the things that has led to the market that we're in is, your Gen Xers and your baby boomers aren't selling their homes. Hmm. That's really what it comes down to. You know, uh, people are commenting on on builders not building enough, and builders have never catered to entry level buyers. That's just not in their wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. They have traditionally catered to buyers that are called move up buyers, where they're selling their first home in order to buy their next home or second to buy their third. Um, but what we're seeing is a lot of Gen Xers, because they're in these low rates, because they purchased their homes when they did, you know, coming out of the recession, mm -hmm. they have super low mortgage payments, you know, super low mortgages in general, and they're staying in their homes much longer. So I think the average now for the industry is people are staying in their homes upwards of 13 years. And I think that that average is going to continue to climb. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, it used right? to be what, like five to seven, or seven to nine years or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So. That's yeah. crazy. So yeah, so the, the amount of time that people are staying in homes is much longer, and that's really affecting this millennial generation, which is the largest. You can combine baby boomers and Gen Xers, and millennials outnumber them. Hmm. And your oldest millennials, us, are in our late 30s, mm -hmm. and your youngest ones are, are in their you know early 30s. And so that's prime time for buyers. And so there's this just huge demand for properties. And there was a big focus on them buying close to city centers, and that's now shifting as the millennial generation is having families, and now they're going back out to the suburbs. And so what I'm thinking is eventually going to happen, builders are noticing this, are taking note, and are going to start building homes for these individuals. They'll start building more starter homes. The average square foot for new home construction has been slowly going down, hmm. so they're not building as many McMansions as yeah. they were and are trying to you know, entertain that market. But that's a slow process. Yeah. And so you know, that's kind of why we're seeing this lack of inventory because Gen X and baby boomers aren't selling. Um, and millennials all want you know, those entry level homes but can't find them. And so you know, in 2020, I think that this spring season, things are gonna get a little bananas. And I actually think, you know, and we'll get into this on our next podcast, our bold predictions, but I think the number of overall sales in Phoenix is gonna go down, um, but I think prices are gonna continue to be pushed up, hmm. and that's just due to that inventory. So Got it. I know you have a ton to share. A lot has happened in the lending world over the past couple of weeks in terms of loan limits, VA loans have yep. changed. All of these are really good things for buyers. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So yeah, I mean, and, you know, a lot has actually happened in the last few days, let alone the last few weeks, you know. So the first thing is, yeah, F, uh, loan limits have come up. Um, you know, last year, conventional loan limit, for instance, was at 484, you know, 484,000. So, you know, you, anything over that, if you're financing that, that's going to put you into more of a jumbo or a high balance category. Or you have to put a lot more down. Or you have to put more down to stay at 484. Um, you know, jumbo and high balance typically will require higher down payments, you know, a little bit better credit scores, things like that. In they order come to with qualify. higher interest rates? Um, 
In most cases, in most you know, cases. Uh, Jumbo actually, oddly enough, has been pricing out better than just a traditional oh. conventional <laughs> program. So kind of a weird thing. So, um, but yeah, so 484. So that went up to 510, 400. So that gives people, you know, the ability to, you know, finance that higher amount, you know, and still, you know, do a, a minimum down, like a 5% down versus like a lot of our high balance programs, you know, require 10%, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it just gives people more flexibility to buy at a little bit higher price point without having to have have the credit they need, you know, or for, for a different program without having to put that larger amount down, which down payment typically is the largest barrier to entry sure. for, you know, somebody buying. There aren't a lot of buyers out there that are buying $500,000 houses for their first house. So most people, you know, their down payment is coming from the sale of their previous house, their move up buyers, like mm-hmm. you said, um, you know, so, but it, you know, there are, they are out there. And so it's giving people that flexibility. Um, FHA loan limits went up. Um, another cool thing that started with FHA is, um, up until recently, you know, in order to buy a condo with FHA, you had to be on the approved FHA condo list. Sure. What, maybe three to 5% of condos in, in Phoenix are on the FHA list. So you- It was a real problem. It was a real problem, yeah. you know? And so you had to do conventional financing. So better credit than FHA, higher, higher down, payment. down payment, things like that. Um, FHA now started a process where you can actually put in a request with for them or with them to have a condo approved. Now. It's kind of a wonky process. They're still fine tuning it, and I'm hoping that it's going to change. You know, but it I at hope least so too. it at least gives people an option. Yeah. You know, um, you know what it is is you know you actually have to we we would have to submit this approval before we even get in the process, and that costs money and takes time, and so it's still not a great option. But it's out there if we needed it. Would um, you say so? Something that we do with our FHA buyers that are looking at condos mm-hmm. is we look at past sales in the community mm-hmm. over the last year. And if there's no FHA deals, Mm -hmm. then we pretty much assume that it's probably not FHA approved. Is that a practice that you would still recommend that we do with our FHA buyers looking at condos? No, No. Um, you know, because because there's such a stigma around FHA not approving condos, I, I wouldn't say past sales are really a good indicator because, you know, these things, uh, there's, there's an FHA approved condo list. It's right online. You mm-hmm. can literally Google that. Um, you can put in the condo community in the county. And, and that still exists. It, that still new, exists. Okay. Exactly. So, and so you can pull it up and, you know, a lot of them used to be approved, but you can see if they have a current certification, which they need. Um, you can see if they're in process of applying for one, and then you can reach out to the HOA and ask, hey, where are you at on this? Um, um, so it just gives a little more information on that. So, um, you know, so that's that was a, a decently big change, but not a huge one, just because the process is still flawed for that. Um, you know, what I, you know, a lot of people that are looking for condos, you know, I think FHA gives them a better interest rate, a little more buying power, you know, lower down payment versus a conventional program. So I have people that are looking to finance conventional loans buying a condo, but they'll be looking for single family residents as well that they can go FHA and still qualify for, mm-hmm. you know, still meet the debt ratio and the credit requirements on. So they get a little more, it's a little higher price point, but they get a similar payment because they're not paying an HOA and things like that. Sure, so, sure. A um, lot of different ways to, to look at that. Yeah. Um, and then what happened with, uh, you know, VA went through a big change here as well, right? They Didn't they just remove loan limits? Um, yeah. So, you know, VA has always kind of followed conventional loan limits, um, you know, and, you know, one of the things that you've been stuck with is it, when you do a VA loan, if you're a veteran, you have entitlement. Um, the max entitlement that you can get is 104250 And what that did was it limited you on what you could finance with a VA and still do limited or no down payment options. So they've kind of restructured a lot of that. So now you can buy at a higher price point with VA and still get a lot of the benefits that you were getting, you know, with from being a veteran and having access to a VA loan. So that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So so a lot of good options out there right now. Um, you know, what's cool is, you know, after the mortgage crash, you know, what, over 10 years ago now, you know, all these programs kind of shriveled up sure. and you had vanilla 30 year loans that everybody was getting. And, you know, we're starting to dabble in these, you know, expanded loan limits, you know, different programs, you know, to really bring a lot more buyers into the market. Um, but everybody's still having to qualify, you mm-hmm. know, so it's not like it was before where there's a bunch of stated loans out there and stuff like that. So, you know, I think it's it's really opening up a lot more options for people. It's a good time to be, you know, to, to, to look because there's a, a ton of ways you can go from the financing sure. side of things. So. Yeah. So I think it's really important when when you are a buyer to work with somebody that understands these things, understands the market and what's taking place. Yep. Um, 
again, because it really comes down to differentiating you from your competition. Absolutely. Of other buyers. Absolutely. And if you're working with somebody, you know, I don't throw them under the bus, but like the big companies where it's just somebody in a call center, mm-hmm. they probably don't have the depth of knowledge that someone like you or a, someone who specializes and only does mortgages all day, every day yep. uh, has. So yep. that, that's another thing that can really differentiate you. 100%. Buyers. You know, it's 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 important because, you know, not only do they may, may they not or they might not know about all the programs that are out there, but they may not tailor a program that's spe- uh, you know specified to what your needs are. Yeah. Um, Let's dive into some of the major economic news in the U.S. And you know, this is hot off the presses. I think like 40 minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, the the biggest news is that China and the U.S. have announced together mm-hmm. a preliminary agreement to halt the trade war. Yes. And so this is very different than what happened in October, where Trump just put out a tweet saying that we're on the verge of a trade deal. Yeah. This is China corroborating that tweet and putting out the same information to their people. Nothing has been signed yet. It's not official. Mm -hmm. Um, But what's really important for us to know, you, me, our audience, is that the trade tariffs that... uh, we're going to be implemented this Sunday are no longer in effect. The penalties, because the the trade tariffs that are existing haven't been eliminated. Those are still they've there. reduced, but they've reduced those by fifty percent. Really? Yes. I just read something. Oh, maybe maybe that, that's old news at Accor- this point. So. According to the Wall Street Journal, they've reduced the existing tariffs from fifteen percent to seven and a half percent. Wow. Okay. The tariffs that were and those tariffs didn't really affect you and me yeah. very much. It greatly affected farmers, the manufacturing sector, which is why, you know, farming bankruptcy has shot through the roof. Mm -hmm. The manufacturing sector has been in a recession now for like the last, I think, four or five months due to those tariffs. The tariffs that were going to affect all of us, us normal consumers, were the ones that were going to go into effect on Sunday. Those are going to be on consumer electronics. So that's TV, cell phones, video games, uh, toys, clothing, those, but so that's gone. So they've eliminated that, which is great. So we shouldn't feel a hit to our pocketbook. Mm-hmm. Um, and so China's also going to increase dramatically. We don't have any numbers. This is all just via, again, a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be purchasing more farm goods from U.S. farmers, okay. uh, which is going to be great. Um, and the, the big one, I think, is China has agreed to structural changes regarding their intellectual property theft, mm. uh, in addition to tech, currency manipulation, and financial services. Um, so, again, none of this is in writing, and we haven't seen the details, but the good news is, is China is reporting to their people the same thing that Trump's people is reporting to us on the U.S. side. Yeah. And so... That is fantastic news. I think that's a huge win for Trump and for the American people, um, as well as the whole U.S., or I'm sorry, as well as the whole world, Mm -hmm. um, because this trade war has really affected the world as a whole. The global economy, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, Other trade news that's coming out is NAFTA 2.0. Looks like it's going to get approved. So what that means to all of us is that free trade for North America will continue. So Canada, the United States, and Mexico. It's pretty much the same deal that existed before with some new things added in in terms of, you know, uh, again, coming to newer technologies, intellectual property, those types of things. And it's in, uh, it has not been signed into law, but it has bipartisan support from both, you know, the Congress, uh, President Trump supports it. The one person that I read that does not support it is Mitch McConnell. Huh. And Mitch McConnell tends to be, he, he seems to roadblock anything becoming a law if the Democrats like it. Interesting. <laughs> so is there is some, you know, there is a possibility that it doesn't get signed into law, but all three countries support it, has support from the president. Bipartisan. Yep, it's yeah. bipartisan. So that, that will be good news. Markets love certainty. They hate uncertainty. Mm-hmm. So all this trade stuff has really been a drag on all economies across the world just due to the uncertainty mm-hmm. that exists. And this is adding cer- some form of certainty. Which is great for the stock market. But yes. one of the downsides is it's not great for mortgage rates. Correct. You know, when when there's uncertainty, mortgage rates tend to dip. Yep. You know, and they tend to climb a little bit. So we've seen a couple of, like, rate increases, you know, over the last few days. Um, you know, some of this stuff has been the rumblings have started coming out. Um, you know, so, but, I mean, rates are 
still spectacularly low. You yes. know, I mean, it's historically they are extremely low. And so it's it, as of right now, even with this news coming out, we haven't seen that big of a move in the market. Um, you know, the, the Fed just met on Wednesday. Yep. Um, you know, they decide to keep rates flat. Flat. Um, and their expectation is that they're going to keep rates flat through 2020. But, yes. you know, obviously there's there's some, you know, pushing from the White House to reduce them further. Yep. And, you know, so we'll see how that goes. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I think we're, we're in for another year of great interest rates and, you know, good options on purchasing and refining. Yeah, refining. it's so funny, the dramatic swing that takes place from this time last year yeah. to today, where, you know, the Fed had uh, was aggressively raising rates yep. and the market was really slowing and it was affecting everybody. And it was like, you know, lots of talks of recession. And now, now all of a sudden, just Here over the are. last cu- couple of months, you know, not, all that has kind of uh, dissipated. There's still like risk out there. Yeah. So I don't want to, you know, uh, say that everything is fantastic, but there is a lot of good news. You know, the job report that came out just crushed expectations, mm-hmm. 80,000 more jobs than yeah, what they had predicted. Yeah, versus 170. It was Two, to be? 260, I think, was the versus, final number. Yeah, 180. Yeah. So I think that the, Usually when you have a jobs report come out that is as high as this one was, the subsequent jobs report after that tend to be lower Mm. and don't quite hit expectations. And so I think what we're seeing now is because unemployment is so low, Mm -hmm. 3.5%, it's the lowest in 50 years, Mm -hmm. there is now a problem of having enough people to actually work and fill Mm. jobs. So, you know, the, when the jobs reports come out, they may not hit expectations, but I think that that's more due to the fact that there's not enough people to fill the jobs. Got it. So that, that'll be interesting to kind of continue to pay attention to. Um, what's also really exciting about this recent jobs report is that we are at a 19-year low for uh, discouraged workers. Those are people that have been have not been in the workforce because mm-hmm. they couldn't find a job. Hmm. That's at a 19 year low, as well as part-time people who want to be full-time mm-hmm. is at a 19 year low. So that's really exciting. So we've seen some growth in sectors that they weren't actually predicting growth in. And so that we've seen wages increase hmm. much higher than inflation as well due to this. So there's a lot of good news coming out of the economy. And so it, it looks like you know things are looking pretty good for 2020. The other thing that just recently came out, um, last thing we'll touch on, uh, it, it is a big deal, is that the Conservative Party in the UK won yep. by quite a bit. By a, it was a landslide. It was a landslide. Which was crazy. It was supposed to be pretty dead even, you yeah. know, but it was, I mean, I, I feel like everyone over there is, they want something to happen. They've been, you know, they've been stuck in this limbo for so long. And so they're- Well, and, the, and for them, their version of the Democratic Party was so liberal mm-hmm. that if they became in power, that they would almost become a socialist country, hmm. was my understanding. And I I think that the U.S. should kind of take stock in that, that if we go too far left, I don't think the country is ready for that, just like the U.K. But what that means for us, why the hell do we care what happens over in uh, England, is now they have certainty. You know, the world has become a lot smaller. All of our economies are interconnected. So with the uncertainty of Brexit, that was really keeping a lot of money off the table and really causing, you know, if if the, if the UK and the EU went into a recession, that would greatly impact negative us. impact yeah. the United States. And so Brexit still needs to happen, but because the Conservative Party over there has the majority, I think they're going to be able to get that through. They're going to be able to withdraw from the EU, and then they're going to spend the next 12 months negotiating a free trade agreement, much like the U.S. has negotiated with you know, our trading partners here uh, on our continent, continent, they're going to be able to do over there. And so, they're supposed to ink something in January, right? Like yeah. It's supposed to happen pretty quick here pretty quick. in the next four to six weeks, I yeah. think. So. Yeah, yeah. So lots of good stuff coming out of the economy. Um, I think that that's kind of what we need to take stock in as we get through the end of the year. Um, I think people's jobs are safe. Um, and you should buy all the stuff for your family and, you know, enjoy yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Wages are up. Jobs are up. Property values are going up. And, you know, for our buyers out there, work with somebody that can help you and just, you know, stick at it. It's yeah. going to be hard. I think 2020 is going to be hard for buyers, but it's going to take perseverance and persistence to get a home. 
And then once you have that home, you get to enjoy the fruits of everybody, you know, with property values going up just like everybody else. Exactly. Yep. So cool. Do you have anything to add? I think that's it. All right. Well, we won't see you or talk to you guys again until after the first of the year. So I just want to, you know, tell everybody whatever you celebrate, enjoy, enjoy the time with your family. I hope you get to eat good food, be safe, have an awesome new year and send us your questions. Uh, and we will see you guys in January. Mm-hmm.